Okay. We had left off where I was going to explain that. Notice it's all in the name of God. Alright? And I stress that because that's the word here. The name. This actual phrase is saying, but it's part of a larger context. Who not written name. That's the literal Greek in its literal order. Okay? So you pronounce it hon u gigraptai not yeah, gigraptai. You you have to sort of go with the G. Gigraptai. Alright, it's, it's more guttural, but I'm not pronouncing it that way. Tonoma. Now you have to say tonoma because if I say to-o-noma, that's considered inelegant. Even in the time that uh, John's writing. They were always debating about whether you, whether you did this. It's called elision. It's the same thing in France today. You know, l'autre instead of l'autre. It's l'autre. All right. This period is covering eight years from the end of Zeno, and that means that Leo the Second is on the throne, to 499 A.D. And in history, this is known primarily as the Acacian Schism. All right. And again, just so that people in other countries don't feel bad, the reason why all this is so Rome-centric is it's a prophecy about Rome. It's a question of who is Rome. So if your country's left out, be grateful. Okay? My problem is, is that the way history is going right now, it looks like the U.S. and the USSR are going to merge. And that's bad. That's really bad. So hopefully some other country will defeat them or they won't manage to merge. Because if they merge, we're talking antichrist type activity. That doesn't mean that the tribulation is going to happen. Alright. But it's paradigmal. And that's why I'm going through this so slowly. Because the paradigm, the center of the paradigm is verse 6 through 8. And we're coming to the end of verse 8. So these are all historical trends. All history comes into the time after Constantine and then all history comes out of what is going to end up being the time through Justin One's death. And right now we've just we're just at Zeno's death. Okay, he started out as a Kai here. Alright, but he's dead by the end of it. So he's not upon the earth anymore. He's no longer an inhabitant on the earth. He dies in 491 AD, which I think is a lot of the reason why John times it as he does. As I said before, he could have left out case. He could just could have said epigase. But he, he could have left this out. But he wants it to be 491. Or the angel did. You know, the packaging he was told. Because it would have been natural for him to want to cap it at 402, not 403. Okay, the promised unit is 490. It only shows in English, or translation, explicitly in Daniel 9.24. Okay, but it's actually the underpinning of the whole Bible, starting in Genesis 1. That's why in Daniel 9, Daniel doesn't ask the angel any questions about why he used those numbers. Because he already knew. His prayer was metered based on the same 490 structure. That's why he's getting an answer about 490. Because his own prayer to God was metered based on the 490 structure. Alright, which I spent some time at the end of the last two increments explaining. Alright, but now we're in like the next clause, which is pretty dramatic. You know, Zeno's dead. Leo II is on the throne. Zeno's kid. Alright. And 
it's like oh their names are not written and since you know what's upcoming their names are not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world then this is bad whatever this is it's bad and whatever it is it's if it's about Christians it's also bad right because this whole thing is about Christians warring with each other see Chaimatos Chaimatos blood against blood Christians doing this this whole thing this whole center of history is what Christians do the unbeliever is not blamed for anything that goes wrong we are so again if you're not a, if you're not in the United States or you know related to Rome in any way be happy because this isn't about you and that you want it not to be about you alright if by contrast also you're not a believer well be very happy because this is the condemnation of believers in Christ it's not a condemnation of you alright now it is true that if you never once believed Jesus Christ paid for your sins between the time you're born and the time you die you will be blotted out of the book of life and you will go to hell so just believe he paid for your sins that's all you need to do and it has to be that easy so it can so anybody can do it you know all of us have a lot of handicaps in our life all right it's got to be simple so that if you've got an IQ above room temperature on a cold Chicago day you can do this and if you don't have an IQ above room temperature on a cold Chicago day you're automatically saved because you can't refuse you have to be unable to refuse the gospel or you say yes once okay so those who haven't live longer you want that the secret to a long life don't believe that Christ paid for your sins ever and you'll live a really long time but you'll be really miserable too all right so this is about whatever since you know what text is upcoming you know that this phrase is technically about who's saved who's not and that's exactly what this period covers see how wry this wording is to match this period in history and it's a really important period it's called the Acacian Schism and at first it's one part of the Byzantine Empire calling the other part of the Byzantine Empire heretics remember we went we were talking about Council of Chalcedon the primary purpose of the Council of Chalcedon was to agree on what is the nature of Christ and anybody who disagreed with that council was deemed a heretic and going to hell now that was a real big problem in the Byzantine Empire because about half of the people who lived in it didn't agree with what the Council of Chalcedon said so you're being you're t condemning me to hell because I don't agree with your man's doctrine I got my own Bible honey I'll believe what I want and a whole lot of people in the middle between the two the two camps the monophysites who had an antithetical definition who were specifically condemned by the Chalcedonian Council they're like screw you buddy and the Chalcedonians were busy saying well you're heretics and it, it, it meant something then they could arrest you they could confiscate your property they could sell you as a slave I mean all that stuff went on then the rules were really really bad it wasn't just shaming okay you lose your life you could be kicked and beaten and tortured and all of your family with you because they didn't just hurt one person okay especially in Byzantine Empire they like putting your eyes out and cutting off your limbs and all kinds of gruesome things like that so the split between the Empire threatened to kill it you want to talk about civil war and blood against blood that's what this Council of Chalcedon did and so all this was you know earlier in the text because it started under the Const Constantine sons but it reached a sort of apex here now the other thing Council of Chalcedon did 
was that it basically said hi whoever you are in Rome whatever Pope you think you are in Rome we don't recognize you you do what you want and you're with your own people but you're not part of us and so the rift between the, the West and the East got really bad here they became enemies essentially now that really mattered because that meant that the flow of the original Greek texts to the West would be down to a trickle because the you know the Byzantines wouldn't want them getting those texts and so everybody stuck with fortunately well divinely Jerome God hired Jerome and made sure that at least a current Latin version was around and I'm sure Jerome you know sent out the manuscripts that he got he had people copy him and stuff to the West at the time he did it so they could compare it for translation all right, because everybody could read Greek and Latin and Hebrew in those days. And Jerome was kind of bookish about that. And the people he knew were also bookish. And he sent copies of what he did to France and Germany and parts of Germany. They didn't call it Germany then. And England. Okay. But those were very few texts by comparison. So when Council of Chalcedon happens, you're talking civil war amongst Christians vertically in the Byzantine Empire and horizontally between Byzant Byzantium and, and Italy's Rome. Okay? So, in here, the so-called Acacian Schism occurs. And it occurs because Zeno, who had just died, he had a guy named Acacia. He was the... the they didn't call him popes, but the Metropolitan of Constantinople, a patriarch. It was Acacia that he had write up the Henoticon, which I covered two increments ago. The Henoticon. Henotes means unity with God, harmony with God, being in line with God. It was famously used as a Greek term in Plato's Philebus. So everybody knew about that. Okay, so that's why Zeno calls it the Henoticon. All right, specifically using a Greek word, not a Latin word, but it basically was trying to say, you know, the Latins who belong, who subscribe to the Chalcedonian view of Christ's nature, it was sort of a, you know, concession to them. And at the same time, Zeno was seeking not to deal with the Monophysites uh, who were, you know, populated most of the Middle East as part of his his territory so that if you're a Monophysite fine be a Monophysite if you're a Chalcedonian fine be a Chalcedonian but the basic Hanoticon was just saying yes Jesus Christ was born begotten of God that's it monogenes is the actual word and it doesn't really mean begotten it means uniquely born which in the context is a lot clearer Christ is uniquely born yes he's God man Nobody's born like him. There's nobody like him. All right, and that's that's in John three sixteen, and you know it says begotten in your English translations. That's not what it means. It, the Greek term is monogenes, and it means uniquely born. And that's what the Hanotikon was about, without defining what uniquely born means. Now that's smart. It was bad that a political guy promulgates a religious view and all the the realm is supposed to abide by it but at least he's trying to not interfere with whether you're Chalcedonian or Meophysite okay Acacia was the guy who wrote it up for him and nobody nobody liked what the Hanoticon said they all wanted to force the other guy to define it their way about what Christ's nature was. Now that's the same problem that was going on under Constantine's sons. There was this joke that ran around in, in New Rome, a.k.a. Constantinople, now called Istanbul, that when you went to get your shoes shined, there was a debate about Christ's nature, whether he was God and man, or really just God, or really just man, or some magical combination of the two. And then when you went to eat in a restaurant and you were served by your waiter, the waiter would ask you questions about whether Christ's nature was this or that or the other. 
In other words, it was the main topic of conversation in Constantinople during the time these kids of Constantine were there, and it will keep on being true. In fact, you're going to get, when we get down to Justinian, there is an actual revolt between the blues and the greens, and th their division was over whether or not over Christ's nature. So this kept on happening. Now, in Zeno, he tried to re reconcile it. It didn't work. The people of Constantinople didn't like the fact that he was trying to reconcile it. So they split with the Pope, not completely but close, okay? And they split within themselves, so they start warring, and then in order, while they're switching sides and stuff like that, and Zeno's trying to, to not Zeno, but Leo, is trying to placate people, they have all these intermarriages. The minute you have intermarriages, with you know rulers you start end up having factions and succession wars so they're worrying over religion and they're worrying over political power all right here okay so when it says who are not written the idea is that you're anathematizing your opposition if you don't believe the way I believe you're going to hell brother so you see why it was clever for the angel or God telling John to park these words here because John could have put these words in any order he wanted it would still have the same meaning these words do not have to be in this position for you to derive the same meaning so all in the name of God okay they're anathematizing each other as if they had the power to cast anybody into hell that's how bad it was. Okay? So, by the end of 499, we're talking everybody's at war over whether or not their views agreed with whoever. And that's going on right now in Christendom and especially in Russia right now. You know, Russia thinks it's the inheritor of the Greeks. And right now, as I talk, Russian Orthodox are persecuting anybody who doesn't agree with the Russian Orthodox line. So this schism thing has not ended even until now. And the worst part about it is that Christians here in the U.S. who don't understand all that, just because the Russian Orthodox are busy talking anti-gay, the, the small-minded Christians who wouldn't know the Bible if it bit them, are going, oh, they're anti-gay. Well, the Russian, the Russian Christians must be true Christians. Yeah. Until they all get together and then one side wipes out the other side over who's really the true Christian. That was what was going on here. And like I said, this whole thing is about paradigms. It's paradigm of history, and honey, it's going on right now. The Russian Orthodox just managed to do some of their own persecution of, I don't know who they did it to, but non-Odox, Jehovah Witness, they did their persecution in France of an organization backed by the French government. And this is just a couple of days old. You can just Google on this. Russian Orthodox Persecution France. Jehovah Witness. Read it yourself. So you see, this, this stuff has a real current meaning. And it all started back here. Okay? Now, I'll cover more about, you know, in the book of life from the foundation of the world next time. Peace out.